All right, it's that time again. WWE went back to Saudi Arabia, and I already know what some of the comments will say, so we'll address them. I am nothing but an honest man. But in my head, the way I look at it, it's nice and easy to review things like Raw and SmackDown and AEW and, I don't know, Backlash, does that even exist anymore? Who knows? You can't just ignore it when things get a bit morally ambiguous. That's when you've actually got to start talking about it more because we don't have the conversation. It's going to keep happening time and time again. The second point to that is I know a lot of people watch ups and downs because they don't want politics to get in their wrestling. They just want to watch the show and be entertained. I like to try and cater for both audiences. That's my part. I've said my bit. My name is Simon Miller. This is What Culture Wrestling. WWE Super Showdown is done. Let's up those downs, remember to subscribe. Right, tying into that intro that we just talked about, this is a reason to cover events like this, because watch what I can do. Well, look at the power I have in my hands. Because of all the controversy that surrounds these escapades out there, I'm gonna say that's where it is, it's just out there, that's where the location is. Give it two downs. There you go, boom, just like that. Now WWE's gotta try and work their way back up. That's right, I may be a positive Pete, but I'm also a controlling Carl. Two downs right there. The Usos took on the revival on the kickoff, and look, it was fine. That's all I can say. It was fine. It kind of reminded me straight away that we shouldn't get too excited about these shows if you do, because they're just house shows. That's all they are. They're glorified house shows. And I imagine this is what the Usos and the Revival have been doing around the country and probably around the world. It finished when the Usos hit double super kicks on both of the Revival and then they got the pin. Yeah. Up. Surprisingly, it was then Seth Rollins versus Baron Corbin to start Super Showdown proper. And I'll tell you something else that shocked me to my core. This was actually all right, and probably the best Baron Corbin performance we've seen for a long time. It even happened a couple of near falls in there that made me go, wait a minute, isn't Baron Corbin gonna become the Universal Champion? That was the thing everyone was worried about, because obviously we knew the cash-in may occur. Maybe Brock was gonna take it off Baron. However, with all that said, the finish was absolutely ridiculous, because WWE just can't get enough of this distraction roll-up finish to the point they're now including their referees, because that's what happened here. The referee got in Baron Corbin's face. After Baron Corbin had got his face, he pushed him, and Seth Rollins rolled him up to retain his Universal Championship. What was that? Univ Universal Championship. Why couldn't have Rollins just curb stomped his ass, and we could have been done with this, and we never had to worry about it again? I'm sick of it, I tell you. I'm sick of it. Down. It then got even dumber because Lesnar kind of lived up to his promise and he started strutting towards the ring to cash in his money in the bank briefcase. But do you know why he did not? Because as Paul Heyman was getting into the squared circle, he tripped over the middle rope. That, for some reason, caused another distraction. So if you're keeping, keeping tally, that's one distraction by referee and one distraction by ring rope. Lesnar was so surprised by this, he turned around like, Paul, what's happened? Why have you dropped my briefcase on the floor? And Seth Rollins then proceeded to absolutely whip his ass with a chair. We did get to see a pretty badass curb stop onto the briefcase, and my word, did Lesnar take that like it was the most legit thing ever. But here's the point we have to make. If you've now tuned in to the last four, well, not the last four WWE shows, but the last four Brock Lesnar WWE focused shows going, ooh, they told me he was gonna cash in, you have now been duped four times, and you're 100% allowed to be pissed off by that. Hence my little rant. The Demon Balor versus Andrade was pretty good though. Give it up. Again, it ticked all the boxes and it's always nice to see the more badass version of Finn, but I am a little confused. Apparently the rules are, Alistair Black is not allowed to come to Saudi Arabia because he has tattoos that are considered controversial, but a literal demon is allowed to be in attendance. Someone tell me because I understand it at all. I do want to give a quick shout out to the commentary though because it was absolutely hilarious and went like this. Corey Graves would say something like, what you need to understand is that the demon is a demon. And Renny Young would go, are you telling me the demon is a demon? And Corey Graves would reply by saying, look, please just be aware that this is a demon. And Michael Cole would chirp in and just go, he's a demon. Balor eventually won after the Coupe de Gras and a lot like the opening tag match, it was just a showcase of people that were able to wrestle. Like I say, there was, there was nothing that exciting, there was nothing that special, it was just talented cats having a talented cat match. The Miz and Jinder Mahal then cut promos pretending that if they win the Battle Royal later on, it's gonna mean something and it's important. I'm sure it is. Then, oh my gosh, Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon was taking on Roman Reigns 
And if you can actually get your head around it, Shane McMahon won. If I could take my head off and throw it, I'd do the rest of it headless down. The stupidest thing was is that McMahon took most of this match and pretty much just whipped Roman Reigns' ass. I mean, he reversed Superman punches every move that the big dog had, he found a way out of. And then, yeah, when all was said and done, he was the winner. I mean, he was only the winner because Drew McIntyre had got in there and slapped Roman Reigns with the Claymore kicks. So Shane snuck in there and got the one, two, three. But still, we found the one person in the whole company who will be pushed stronger and bigger than Roman. And of course, it's Shane McMahon. Look what he does to my body when I say his name. Shane McMahon, I'm so sick of it. I mean, the only person I can remember him losing to recently is The Undertaker. And to get to that point, he had to throw himself off the top of a hell in a cell. And then the phenom just picked his bones. Well, I'm going to pick your bones, Shane. And I'm going to put him in a dustbin. Quick interview with The New Day as Kofi Kingston wanted to let us all know that he is just as intense as Dolph Ziggler. And I bet you at one point in the future, WWE books that stimulation match. It'll be an intense off and they'll just stare at each other until someone blinks. And you lose. Lars Sullivan versus the Lucha House Party was next. And let's just be honest, let's just call a spade a spade. It's not working, is it? He ain't that scary. I mean, it was hilarious how much bigger he was than his opponents. But I kind of sat there just twiddling my thumbs like this. And I was thinking about cheese. I was like, I wonder if I could ever eat a big block of cheese. And then I remembered I was meant to be watching Lars Sullivan versus Lucha House Party. Down. I mean, he did look like the last boss in Punch Out, and that was quite fun. But this whole thing was a bit like a fly buzzing around your head. And you keep trying to get the fly, but you can't. And eventually you grab it, but then he shouts out to all his fly mates and they come in and they attack you so much somehow you get disqualified, even though you're not in a wrestling match. But in the context of this wrestling match, that is what happened. Eventually Lucha House Party just decided, oh, we're just going to attack Lars Sullivan because we're bored of being beaten up. So yes, Sullivan won via disqualification, even though he was taking on three guys that haven't been pushed in 72,608 years. What the hell is going on? I thought Lars was meant to be WWE's new big project, especially because they love dudes that look like monsters. Also, what about Lucha House Party Rules, whatever the hell that was called? What happened to that? That just vanished, didn't Actually, I think that actually did get cancelled, but still, maybe those three were just confused and more power to them. I know, I was confused too. Triple H versus Randy Orton followed, complete with the game revving his way to the ring because that's just what he does now and look it was fine it was all right was it a little bit too long yes is it still weird that every time triple h and randy would have a match they pretend it's really personal they hate each other and they lock up and have a catcher's can wrestling match yes but then i get a slight kick out of seeing you know two legends i guess going at it one more time i did but mostly because of the finish Therefore, he can get up. So yeah, this did plot along like a cow waiting to be milked until we got to this closing sequence. Because not only did we see Triple H kick out of an RKO, but we also saw Randy Orton kick out of the pedigree. And he did that because he was going to go for his old school punt. You remember the punt, but Triple H's like, no, you don't, pal. And he gave him his big move. But again, I tell you, because it was so slow, the ending kind of got me. And then I look back on it and go, you know what? I kind of enjoyed it. I mean, they were on the outside and Triple H was slamming Randy Orton into the announce table, but it wouldn't break. Eventually he threw Randy Orton back in the ring. He ran at him, I care out of nowhere. And that's right, Triple H lost, Randy Orton won. So the sheer surprise of this actually put it over the top for me. And while it was going on, I was doing this. Like that gift. Smile like, yeah, okay, I'll take it. We then got a recap of everything that happened on the plane over to Saudi Arabia with the 24-7 championship, R-Truth and Jinder Mahal. And I'll just say this, if you haven't seen it, it's out there on WWE social media channels. You should go check it out. R-Truth remains a hero. And then we had to have Baron Corbin complaining that he lost and saying that he is going to ensure that heads roll. So I'm going to start a tally. I don't know what the number is right now, but I'll start from this day on. Every time a wrestler threatens murder or death, I'm going to do a big tick like that. I mean, what are you going to do, Barry? Are you going to go around with a big axe and start executing people? No, you're not, you liar. Braun Strowman then proceeded to flex in Bobby Lashley's face for a few minutes. At one point, he also screamed at him. And it was a bit like, do you remember that Mummy movie from way back in the day with Brendan Fraser, whatever his name is? Do you remember the actual Mummy, the actor? And he turned into that big bit of sand and he went, Ugh. That's what Braun Strowman did. And I was like, that's a really odd, strange thing to do. If I was in a fight, like, because you want to believe wrestling, that's the point, and someone was coming at me, and it was like this big dude, and he was terrifying, I wouldn't look at them and go, hmm. The idea here, though, was to show that this was a balance between strength and agility, which meant not only did I see Braun Strowman do a judo roll, which he executed very nicely, but Bobby Lashley did a leapfrog, and he power slammed Braun Strowman like he was a puppet. So, in a rare moment here on Ups and Downs, from a wrestling point of view, I was so taken aback by this, 
it can happen up. Ultimately though, this just went far too long, especially because it was following Triple H Orton, which I'm pretty sure is still going. And there was just too many matches on this card that didn't know when to cut it short. I'm sick and tired of these pay-per-views that go on forever when really they could be a lot shorter. So when Braun Strowman had eventually power slammed Bobby Lashley and got on the win, I was quite pleased. But overall, it gets a down. More superstars were then talking about winning that battle royal, including Ali and Samoa Joe. And when we come back to Michael Cole, he said that it's a lot of wrestlers' dreams to win it. I laughed out loud, because no wrestler has ever said that in history. Kofi Kingston versus Dolph Ziggler for the WWE title followed. And it was all right, mostly because I realized watching this, I just love Kofi Kingston. He's a lovable, easy to enjoy baby face. And you don't get much of that in WWE nowadays. You better. I don't even care about all this pancake stuff that seems to be the new thing to moan about. Have you seen kids' faces as Kofi Kingston walks to the ring chucking out those sweet treats that lights up like a Christmas tree? They're so happy to see him. Wrestling isn't just for a bunch of cynical adults like you and I. The only problem here was that the fans didn't really care, and I think that's because they were holding all their energy for Goldberg versus Undertaker, which was coming up in the main event. And there were a few cool near falls here that tripped you, making you think that Ziggler was going to win. Of course, he didn't. Eventually, he got smashed with that trouble in paradise. One, two, three. See you later, Ziggles. Should have stuck to your stand-up tour. I mean, I will point out that Xavier Woods did get involved at one point because Dolph Ziggler kicked him right in the face. Woods was like, well, I don't appreciate that. So he kicked him right back. And that's where the finish came from. And then we had to go to a promo backstage where Dolph is still really mad because it should have been me. It should have been me. Hey, Dolph, how you doing? Shut up. It should have been me. And he challenged Kofi Kingston to a steel cage match. And yes, we're going to have that at stomping grounds. Maybe it should have been him. I don't even know what you're referring to anymore, Dolph. Get me some apples. No, it should have been me. Oh, you're a terrible friend. A bunch of people then just walked out for the biggest battle royal ever. And of course, that is 50 individuals. And I think if I remember correctly, the only ones that got a proper entrance were The Miz. He had one, Samoa Joe, Titus O'Neil. So they could go, oh, oh, oh lol, is he going to trip up? And who else had one? Oh, Elias. He was doing his ding, ding, ding. I'm Elias. And I get that we can't do one for everyone, but if you are a performer, you must be so dejected when you see that running sheet and realize you just have to walk out like a chump. Oh, yes, yeah, Cesaro. He was allowed the big one too. But do you know who was just standing in the ring, though? Ricochet. And I can't for the life of me understand why WWE doesn't understand what they've got with that man and try and push him to the moon. And because I'm just in that kind of mood today and I can do what I want, that's getting it down. Anyway, Elias then did play a song saying he's going to win. That pissed the Miz off. And then really, this was just a mess. I mean, it was very impressive visually, and I can see it being gift for days, but you couldn't keep up or understand what the hell was going on. It was just, it was just crazy. It was just that. It was a marketing thing, right? It was a marketing. Oh, we're going to have the biggest battle royal ever. But at no point did anybody sit down and go, um, what's that going to look like? I think it may look terrible. And it did. There were also some surprising names in there, including the AOP, which kind of proves that WWE officially hates the tag team division. Well, I am going to give a quick shout out and I am going to give some props to the ending because it did come down to Elias versus Mansoor, who is the Saudi Arabia wrestler that we saw 12 months ago and who debuted in NXT a couple of weeks ago. Because, my friends, he won and when he did, the fans in the arena went absolutely nuts. Now, I know that's a, a cheap way to end a match and, of course, you're always going to go crazy for your hometown hero, but this man, he looked so made up, he looked so happy. I couldn't help but go like, you know what, that's a feel-good moment. And trust me, on shows like these, we need feel-good moments. Give it up. Mansell cut a promo afterwards, and I believed every word that he said. And for all the naysayers out there, I will just point this out. At least one kid in attendance at this show will have seen it and been inspired. And as Whitney once said, I believe the children are our future, so let's educate and let's motivate. Also remember that none of this matters long term because all of these shows mean nothing. They're going to be forgotten about by Raw, which is why they're absolutely pathetic all around. There was then some graphics of the matches at Stomping Ground shown on the big screen. And when Becky Lynch was up there, she got a massive reaction. Cough, cough, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But it was also confirmed that we're going to get Corbin versus Seth Rollins again. I can't believe this. I thought we were doing it here so we'd never have to do it again. And now we're doing it again. And I couldn't handle it to the point I did this. What is this? Like I'm looking through some kind of tunnel. I'm just trying to block out the bad thoughts. Down. It was then time for Goldberg and his beard. And I just want to point out, I absolutely love this facial hair. I think it's absolutely badass. It's one of those beards you can only grow when you're past 50. Because if you had tried to grow it before that, it wouldn't have worked. Because he looks like a jacked up, terrifying Santa. Imagine that coming down your chimney. Who wants a present? Undertaker was next in. And by the time he actually got to the ring, I'd grown my own full beard and shaved it off. But look, if you had missed the fact that he was at WrestleMania 35, 
My word, did you get all the pomp and circumstance here. We had the Druids, we had this organ playing to bring them out. Undertaker did his crazy entrance and it's still one of the most amazing sights in all of wrestling, even after all these years. And look too, if we focus on the first half of this match, I actually thought it was quite decent. Or at least, what else did you expect from Bill Goldberg, who is 52, and The Undertaker, who is 54? If you had written down on your prediction sheet, I expect a Carda versus Omega, well, you're a darn fool. And again, until we got to the bit we'll talk about in one second, this was a lot of fun. We got two spears out of nowhere, which made me stand up from my seat and go, all right, here we go. And we saw everybody kick out of their moves. We saw a kick out of a tombstone, and like I say, we saw a kick out from a spear. Then, however, Things went absolutely downhill, even to the point that if I tried to defend it, I would be a darn fool. Basically, this match went way too long. I can only assume that both The Undertaker and Bill Goldberg were exhausted. I mean, at one point, Bill Goldberg had just blood pouring from his head. I doubt that was intentional, given the surroundings, but still, that was absolutely nuts. And everybody started to fall on their heads. We saw a tombstone where I'm pretty sure Undertaker just smashed Goldberg's skull straight into the canvas. And I think it's only fair to say it was the most terrifying jackhammer I've ever seen in my entire life where the Undertaker's neck just compiled in on each other like an accordion. When that happened, I was sat right there and I made this noise. Yeah. Like a baby goat giving birth. Baby goat giving birth, just a normal goat giving birth. The ending was clearly finished on the fly, or at least I think so, because the Undertaker just pinned Goldberg after a random choke slam, and I just hope that everyone is okay. I am gonna point out that I do respect these two to keep going at it. But again, we should have shaved some minutes off this and just got to the end point as quickly as we could. So for the second half, yeah, this isn't a mean one, it's just an obvious one. What else can I do? That's gotta get it down. Also, throughout all of this, just on a side note, Corey Graves and Michael Cole, and I know we've said this for years, but I want someone to explain it to me, kept saying, oh, The Undertaker, the purest striker in the game. What does that mean? What is a pure strike? If I'm gonna hit someone in the face, I just wanna slam them right in the face. What does pure mean? Do I like swan in like a ballet dancer? People are like, oh, look, he's so pure. Or does someone like run a test on me and go, he's never committed a crime or he's never had sex, he's so pure. What does a pure striker mean? So yeah, half of it was quite entertaining and the nostalgia was strong for this one. And the second half was like, oh yeah, nostalgia comes with a serious dose of reality as well. And that did bring WWE Super Showdown to an end, thank goodness. And look, while I guess there were some highlights. Really, if we're being honest, it's a nothing show. I've said that a few times, it's nothing. Nothing, there's no, there's no consequence, there's no importance. It's just there. You could have skipped this and you've missed nothing and tie that in with everything else that goes with these shows. You know what's happening. It's getting an overall down. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about WWE Super Showdown. Like, share and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles. Follow what culture on Twitter, whatculture, WWE, and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon Miller. Thank you very much for watching. And look, if you're around on Sunday, why don't you stop back in? There's a little show going down in New Japan called Dominion, and you're damn right. To finish off this crazy ups and downs week, we got our ups and downs one more time. I'll see you then.